worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the fields abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with man is now residing, yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages, live your contemplations, brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations, ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship. Come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. Though an infant now we view him, he will share his Father's throne. Gather all the nations to him, every knee shall then bow down. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, tonight we have the opportunity of looking at something that we briefly, very briefly covered back when we were in Acts chapter 2, which was the issue of baptism. But tonight in particular, we'll be looking at believers' baptism. And some folks uh, uh, came up to me a week ago and they went, believers' baptism? <gasps> like that. Oh, dear folks. <laughs> Let's talk about it tonight, because it is in the New Testament. And so we are looking at Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. But let me summarize very quickly what we have done over the last three weeks prior to the creation conference and give you a one-line summary of each of the books of the Old Testament as they point to Christ, because immediately preceding this, we find the Ethiopian eunuch as he is reading from the prophet Isaiah, and Philip comes and joins himself at the command of the Holy Spirit to that chariot, and beginning at that portion of Isaiah chapter 53, which is verses 7 and 8, it says he preached unto him Christ. And so we looked at Christ in all of the scriptures, and we saw the two portions of text in the New Testament where our Lord Jesus Christ specifically says that he is found in all of the law and in all of the prophets. Luke chapter 24, verse 25, as he speaks to those who are on the road to Emmaus, he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so we saw our Lord Jesus Christ in each and every one of the books of the Old Testament. In Genesis 1, as compared with John 1, Jesus as the Creator. In Exodus, Jesus as Jehovah, who spoke to Moses at the burning bush. In Leviticus, Jesus as the sacrificial Lamb of God. In Numbers, Jesus as our great High Priest. In Deuteronomy, Jesus as the Prophet of God. In Joshua, Jesus as the divine, omnipresent companion. In Judges, Jesus as the ascended victor. In Ruth, Jesus as the seed of the prophesied line. In 1 Samuel, Jesus as the anointed one of the Lord. In 2 Samuel, Jesus as the king over his people. In 1 Kings, Jesus as the king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, which we also see in Zechariah. In 2 Kings, Jesus and the Ascension. In 1 Chronicles, Jesus and the Royal Genealogy. 
In Second Chronicles, Jesus, the wisest ruler of all. In Ezra, Jesus and the building of the temple. In Nehemiah, Jesus and our protective wall against temptation. In Esther, Jesus, the despised, becomes Jesus, the glorified. In Job, Christ as the protector from Satan. In Psalms, Christ, the crucified, the Savior, and the King. In Proverbs, Christ, the wisdom of God. In Ecclesiastes, the vanity of life is only answered in Christ. Song of Solomon, Christ as the heavenly bridegroom with an eternal love that cannot be bought. In Isaiah, Christ, the suffering servant. In Jeremiah, Christ, the righteous Lord of the temple. In Lamentations, Christ, the merciful one to the suffering. In Ezekiel, Christ, the messianic ruler. In Daniel, Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Hosea, Jesus, to be brought to Egypt as a baby and then called back to the land of Israel. Joel, Jesus, and the day of the Lord. Amos, Jesus, who led Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Obadiah, Jesus, the wisdom of God. Jonah, Jesus, the one resurrected from the dead. Micah, Jesus, the Messiah born in Bethlehem. Nahum, Jesus, and the glad tidings of peace. Habakkuk, Jesus, as the focus of our faith, who worked a work which they did not believe. Quoted that way in the book of Acts, justification by faith and not by the law. Zephaniah, Jesus, as king, slays his enemies at the battle of Armageddon, and feeds their flesh to the birds. Haggai, Jesus as the judge of the nations. Zechariah, Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Malachi, John the Baptist and Elijah are the forerunners of Christ. Christ in all the scriptures. And so we see him there. And many more things could be added. As you know, in many of those books, we gave several illustrations which are clearly seen in the New Testament, pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. But I gave to you each of those different ones that we might remember our Lord is portrayed in his glory and in his fullness as we search the scriptures. And there we discover Christ. Tonight we want to talk about believers' baptism. Acts chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophets this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, we don't want to get into arguments over modes of baptism tonight. But we want to understand what believers' baptism is all about. And why are there so many recorded instances of it in the New Testament? Because certainly it is still available today. Notice some things, though, that are important here in the text. Before being baptized, the eunuch had to believe the scriptures concerning Christ. Philip began at that text in Isaiah 53 and preached unto him Jesus. That passage deals with the death of Christ and at the end of chapter 53 with the resurrection of Christ. Philip started in Isaiah 53 and gave to the eunuch an understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus had done. It's very important that God chose that particular passage of all the messianic passages in the scriptures for the eunuch to be reading at that precise moment of time 
when the Holy Spirit caused Philip to join himself to that chariot. Philip began there and preached Christ, and we know what he preached about Christ because the text specifically tells us that Christ would die for our sins and that he would rise from the dead. Very important because that is the gospel containing all the key elements necessary for our salvation as the Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. The gospel by which we are saved. That becomes very important as we discuss baptism for there are a lot of heresies concerning baptism as a part of salvation. And we're going to discuss some of those tonight as they are taught by the various cults. Before being baptized, the eunuch had to believe the scriptures concerning Christ, concerning his death for our sins and resurrection from the dead. So the issue that we look at first tonight was water baptism needed to accomplish his salvation, or was it the outward manifestation of his faith? We notice Philip's words here. The eunuch requests baptism, but Philip doesn't automatically baptize him or say, yes, that's the next step in order to get you saved. Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Believer's baptism is based upon faith of the individual who understands who Jesus is and what he did and that believer then personally trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. This is very important as we look at the mission field today because many missionaries go to places where the name of Christ has not yet been named. And the people with whom they come in contact are coming out of perhaps gross paganism of all the various sorts that exist in this world. Those are people who are not baptized to get them saved, not brought into the church and made members of the church because they happen to be able-bodied and willing to help put up a building. Only those who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, as Philip makes clear to the Ethiopian eunuch here, are to be baptized. The issue here is not mode of baptism, but meaning. Apostates who are on their way to hell baptize by all of the different modes. There are people on their way to hell who baptize by sprinkling, by pouring, by dipping, and by immersion. For example, Mormons and Catholics on both ends of that spectrum. Mode of baptism does not exclude the possibility of heresy. I know a dear brother in Christ years ago who felt that mode of baptism was most important because that would keep the church straight and keep it out of heresy. That's not true because heretics and cultists use every one of the different modes of baptism. The second issue is the issue is not age of the baptized individual but the meaning. It's not a matter of adult or child but we discover in scripture as you've heard me preach before it's not a matter of either or, but of both and, but for different reasons. The third thing that we note is the issue revolves around the purpose for which the baptism is taking place. And we have to ask a question, what kind of baptism are you talking about? And then we have a statement that water baptism is not necessary for salvation. And as we have done our studies in the Gospel of John several years ago, we covered the six main areas of baptism dealt with in the New Testament. I'll just briefly list those for you. We'll not go into them tonight. But baptism in general. We looked at the terms and the meaning of the words. The words go back to a root, which means to identify or to identify with. The terms bapto, baptizo, baptismos, and so on do not refer to a mode. They refer to a point of permanent identification with something or someone. For example, Moses was baptized in the cloud and in the sea with all the children of Israel. 
They were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Not one of them got wet. The people who got wet on that occasion were Pharaoh and his army. And they got wet permanently. The issue is the permanent identification with someone or something. That's the meaning of the underlying root terminology. The second thing that we looked at was the baptism of John the Baptist. And we saw that that related to the repentance of national Israel in preparation for the Messiah. None of us today, and nobody post-Pentecost for sure, other than the disciples of John, had anything to do with the baptism of John. These are not the baptisms of John that are taking place in the New Testament. John is not our model. John is not the one that we identify with in baptism because his baptism was a baptism of repentance for national Israel preparing the way for the Messiah as we see in the last few verses of the book of Malachi and the quotations concerning John out of the book of Isaiah. Preparing the way of the Lord, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The fourth is the issue we discussed tonight, and we'll see it in much more detail than we did back at that time, which is believer's baptism, and we see multiple illustrations of believer's baptism in Acts. Then there was the issue of infant baptism, which ties to the issue of household baptisms in the New Testament. We'll be talking about those household baptisms, which come up several times in the book of Acts when we arrive at them. And finally, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of which water baptism is a symbol and a type. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that which uni unites us and identifies us at the moment of salvation with the body of Christ. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. The baptism of the Holy Spirit happens to everyone who is truly saved at the very moment of their salvation when that individual is permanently united to the body of Christ, given his spiritual gifts, given his responsibilities in the church, and at that point he begins his spiritual growth as the Holy Spirit illumines the scripture to him. So now here we are in the New Testament. We're post-Pentecost, and we discover as we look through the book of Acts that there are four kinds of adult baptism. It's at the point when an adult is saved out of one of four different areas. Number one, when they are directly saved out of Judaism. We see that in Acts chapter 2. We see them being baptized, as here we find in Acts 8, when they are saved out of proselytism. Here is a man who is an Ethiopian who has converted to the Jewish faith and has gone to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts and is on his way home. He is saved out of proselytism. The third type we see who are receiving baptism in the New Testament as adults are those who have been saved out of paganism, those who are saved out of a false religion. We find that illustrations of those as we get over to Cornelius, who is a God-fearer, he does good things for the Jews, but he is not Jewish himself. He's being saved out of Roman paganism. And the fourth type that we see being saved and being baptized in the book of Acts are those who are saved out of demonism. That's like Simon the sorcerer that we saw, who believed, who was baptized, and who followed Philip a little earlier here in the book of Acts. In the New Testament, we also see when an adult head of a house is saved and his family or her family is still under his or her authority, which implies children, because those would be the ones under authority, the entire family is baptized. It's rather interesting to see that there are no exclusions anywhere stated in the New Testament regarding the age of the family members that come to Christ and are baptized. Number seven, the issue of heresy. Baptismal heresies are not the result of baptismal method or baptismal age because all the modes and ages, as I said a moment ago, are found in the cults. For example, the cultic Church of Christ, so-called, and the Mormons both practice adult immersion. Roman Catholicism practices baby sprinkling. 
Eastern Orthodox practice baby immersions. They hold them by the heel and dunk them under while they're holding their noses. In most of these instances, the heresy centers around baptismal regeneration. That is, these folks believe that by being baptized, that is necessary for salvation. Whether you're trying to save an infant or try to save an adult, it may be one of several different things that are required. Church of Christ requires five things for your salvation, including being baptized in one of their buildings, in one of their tanks, by one of their ministers. Anything else doesn't count. It also has to have a precise formula under Church of Christ theology in order to be saved, one of the things that you need for your salvation. Folks, that's heresy. We'll see that in a moment, that the many things they require are not in fact stated as requirements in the New Testament. Most of them go back to Acts chapter 238, uh, especially the context, verses 36 through 41, where they are trying to insist that verse 38 requires water baptism for salvation. We find Peter preaching here in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's just spoken to them of the resurrection. He reminds them again of the crucifixion. He has just preached to them the gospel, which Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is the gospel by which we are saved. Now when they heard this, verse 37, they were pricked to the heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now here is the key verse that has been perverted to teach baptismal regeneration. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. Three thousand Jewish men, you know the discussion that I've had concerning who actually got baptized on that day, where they were located in the courtyard of the men in the temple in Jerusalem, the indicators in the text that tell us that Peter was preaching to males only, uh, many different things that are there in Acts chapter 2, let us know that these people believed, received Christ, and then were baptized. These were all adults that were baptized there on the day of Pentecost. The doctrine of baptismal regeneration has plagued the church for centuries. Not only is it taught by Roman Catholicism, Mormonism, Church of Christ, various charismatic cults, and certain heretical deviations, but it's also taught in certain circles of Reformed theology, and this is where we need to pay attention, because these are folks that you will come in contact with. I have come in contact with them. I personally know the minister who started some of this heresy within the last 20 years. I have sat and heard him preach. I had a professor who was at law school involved in his congregation. A very good professor, a fine Christian man, but one who I think has been caught up in this heresy. A very serious heresy. Beginning at a church in Birmingham, Alabama and Moscow, Idaho. Some very bright people involved in this who now are teaching under the banner of Reformed theology that water baptism is necessary for salvation. In fact, not merely those involved in this offshoot group, which is called FIRE, F-I-R-E, which I believe stands for Fellowship of Independent Reformed Evangelicals, but also in those who are involved in the federal vision. Some of you are familiar with the writings of Dr. Paul Elliott, who has exposed this. In fact, he came out of the OPC because it was being tolerated, and it is still being tolerated today, 
those who say that salvation is a combination of faith plus works. And one of the works which they require is water baptism for salvation. And those who are in the fire movement say that it is not only necessary for the infant to be baptized to be saved, but they also teach that it is necessary for the infant to take the Lord's table to be saved. It's called pedo communion. Not only pedo baptism, which means child baptism, but pedo communion, which means child communion. And they say that unless the adults take that baby and get the elements of the Lord's table into the baby's mouth and down to his stomach, that baby will not be saved. Dear folks, that's parading today as a very bad heresy under the banner of Reformed theology. You do not find that in Scripture. But that is because they have followed reason rather than revelation. It's a very dangerous thing. Many very bright people throughout the centuries have been in Reformed circles for which we praise God. Some circles hate any kind of education, but there has been a great deal of serious scripture study and very brilliant writing in our circles. However, when any individual gets off of scripture as the foundation and begins to spin theology based on reason, you very soon get on thin ice. The scripture is the final authority and the touchstone for all faith and practice. Don't be confused by labels just because someone calls themselves reformed. Just like the world around us, we don't like it, but they get confused when we call ourselves Bible Presbyterians. They say, ah, Presbyterians, that means liberal, that means pro-gay, that means, you know. Don't be confused by labels. Find out what the people believe and whether or not it fits with Scripture. That is our final touchstone in all matters of faith and practice. Be like the Bereans who checked the Apostle Paul out with the Word of God. Some people have suggested that the solution to this problem is the uniqueness of the audience in Acts 2, the Jewish males who've rejected Christ, but now they trust in Christ. Some have suggested that they alone would have to be baptized for salvation, but the requirement does not apply to anyone else. On the far end of the spectrum, as contrasted with the ultra-reform, the people in the Federal Vision and the Fire Movement, on the other end of the spectrum are what are called ultra-dispensationalists. And they are people who have rejected baptism, and some of them have rejected the Lord's table, and said those things are only for the book of Acts. So you've got those who are teaching over on the one side that baptism and the Lord's table within the so-called body of Christ they're teaching those things are necessary for salvation, while others have come to the conclusion they throw the whole thing out. They don't want either water baptism or the Lord's table. You'll discover that when you have extremes like that on two sides, that the balance will probably be found somewhere in the middle, and you go back to Scripture to get the balance. The problem with both those views is that Jews were saved on the same basis as the Gentiles throughout the New Testament. You can't just say, well, that Acts was Jewish, so we don't have anything to do with it. Or because it's Jewish, therefore, we want to make sure that we're under the law and that we have to do these things in order to get saved. In the New Testament, we discover that Jews are saved on the same basis as the Gentiles. For example, the salvation of Cornelius and his household in Acts 10.47. After they receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit manifests himself audibly, to Peter, he says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? The Holy Spirit received clearly before baptism. Or at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, we find James comparing both the Jews and the Gentiles because we find Gentiles have now been saved. And there have been those heretics who said, well, 
You know, they have to keep the law of Moses in order to be sanctified, not merely saved, but sanctified. James says, but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Both are placed on the same footing for salvation. There are not two different kinds of salvation in the book of Acts. There's only one kind of salvation. It's salvation by grace through faith alone. And James actually points out that the Gentiles have been saved by grace through faith and that they as Jews will be saved in exactly the same manner as the Gentiles. Not saying we were saved by grace through faith, therefore the Gentiles will be saved by grace through faith. He starts with the Gentiles. They were saved by grace through faith. And let me remind you all, that's the way that we Jews, we who in the Council of Jerusalem are here, we too were saved by grace through faith. Very important to pay attention to what is being said in the text. So whatever we conclude, the method of salvation is the same for both Jews and Gentiles. And the book of Acts also gives us a positive statement of what is necessary for salvation. In Acts 16, you're familiar with verses 30 and 31. That's the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas have been beaten, thrown in jail. Earthquake happens. Everybody's chains are broken loose, the door is popped open, and after the jailer is about to commit suicide, Paul says, don't kill yourself, we're all here. He calls them out and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you find a big tank someplace that we can pop you into and baptize you. That's not what they said. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. He's baptized after he believes, but not before. So why baptism? The reason, I think, is that in each setting, both of individual and group salvation in the book of Acts, where we see baptism taking place, we see that baptism is done not as a necessary or effectual means of salvation, but rather it is an accompanying symbol, which is a visible symbol of an invisible reality. To answer the question, we have both internal evidence and external evidence. The internal evidence rests within the Acts 2.38 passage we read a moment ago. The external evidence rests in other statements in the New Testament which declare that water baptism is not necessary for salvation. Those passages also tell us what the invisible reality is that the visible symbol points to. First, the internal evidence. Little Greek lesson. I'll make it simple. It is a very simple lesson. Grammatically, what's going on in Acts 2.38? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The first thing we notice in this verse is that there is a change from plural to singular in the two controlling verbs. There are two verbs in this text as you read it. The verb repent and be baptized. Both are in imperative forms. But repent is in the plural, like we would say in Texas, y'all repent. That's not coming across for us mostly in English, but that's what you see there in the Greek text. It's a plural. Be baptized is in the singular. It's clearly expressed in the phrase, every one of you, which is also found here in this verse. The second thing to notice is that there is a change of person from second person to third person, you know, first, second, and third persons, singular and plural. Here we find a change from singular to plural. The next thing to notice is that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without having the other. That's true for salvation, both of Jews and Gentiles, Acts 2, 30, Acts 2 20, 20, 21, excuse me. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There are those people who claim to have faith and have trusted Christ, 
but it makes no difference in their lives. That is a dead faith. James says so. Faith without works is dead, being alone. Just like the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. You see, genuine faith always results in a changed life. The changed life does not bring salvation. Faith brings salvation. But when the man is born again, when he becomes alive by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will change his life. There will be a difference five years later from the way in which he was at the moment of his salvation. There will be a difference 10 years later. There will be a difference 15 years later because the living person begins to grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, it's not a matter of works saving the individual, but the works will follow in the life of an individual who has truly been saved. So if we connect the singular parts of the sentence together and the plural parts of the sentence together, we see which parts of the sentence each verb controls. Repent, that's plural, for the remission of sins of you, plural, and ye, plural, shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We find that the inward change of heart, which is what repentance deals with, results in the remission or the sending away of sins and the reception of the Holy Ghost in this passage. And then the phrase, be baptized, is singular, every one of you, singular, in the name of Jesus Christ. So the solution is simple, and the problem dissolves when you know the sentence structure. Nobody was saved by water baptism on the day of Pentecost. They were all adult Jewish men. Gentiles, as well as Jews, are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, as we have just seen in that passage I read out of Acts chapter 15, at the Council of Jerusalem. The second is the external evidence, not merely the internal evidence, but external evidence where we see other passages where baptism clearly did not take place or did not save. The thief on the cross, who, by the way, was most likely Jewish as well. There was obviously no time for baptism, but he was clearly saved and clearly on his way to heaven. Luke twenty-three forty-three, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The second word from the cross, which we looked at in our preparatory service two weeks ago. Number two, the list of elements of the gospel, which are listed for us clearly in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel by which we are saved does not include baptism. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. You can read the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, and you will not find baptism required anywhere for salvation. In fact, he explains it to us in verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That includes Isaiah 53, where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. The gospel by which we're saved, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures takes us back to Isaiah 53 and to multiple other passages in the Old Testament. Number three, we find the clear statement that baptism is not part of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about baptism. And he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. Oh, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now, he did baptize a lot of people. We'll discover that as we get a little bit farther uh, in the book of Acts. He baptized a lot of folks at Corinth, but he didn't keep baptismal records as to who he had baptized. The ones that stood out in his mind were Gaius and Crispus. Crispus was the chief Jew who got saved. Gaius was the chief Gentile who got saved. 
And Stephanus, there was a whole household, and they had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints in Achaia. Paul remembered those. Those were people who really stood out in his mind, but he couldn't remember who else at Corinth he had baptized. Verse 17. Notice the difference between Paul's commission and the commission given to the other eleven at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. The end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells the disciples that they're supposed to teach the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We'll look at that in just a moment. He sent them, and part of their commission was to baptize. Notice what Paul says about his commission as the apostle to the Gentiles. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, Paul baptized, but that wasn't part of his commission. And it is clearly, from the text before us, is not part of the gospel. He sets it in contrast to the gospel. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with words, wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. People tend to look at outward symbols and ignore inner realities. Paul wanted them to focus on the cross, not on who got baptized by whom. Some were arguing, well, you know, they were followers of Paul, others of Apollos, others followers of Cephas, and some were saying, but we're followers of Christ. He says, you don't get it, folks. The central issue is the cross, not who baptized you. The central issue is your relationship with Christ and how has that changed your life? You people at Corinth need to get your act together. Only nine verses, the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians, give them any commendation. The rest of the epistle is excoriating them for their sin. And one of the first things he deals with are their arguments over baptism. Number 15, the symbolism of water baptism. Water baptism symbolizes the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit identifying believers and their families with the body of Christ invisibly, symbolized by the visible representation of water baptism. There's a unique picture in Scripture of not federal vision, but federal headship whereby children are seen in their parents. That's the reason you and I were born dead in our trespasses and sins, because when Adam sinned, God saw all of us in Adam. In Adam all die. Even so, in Christ, those who are in Christ, shall be made alive. Every human being born into this world is born dead in trespasses and sins. They also commit overt sins, sins of commission, and they also have sins of omission, but they are born spiritually dead in sin. It's only at the moment that the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God, reaches into the heart of the individual, and through the Word of God regenerates and gives saving faith that that individual becomes alive and becomes in Christ. That's our experiential picture, though we have been seen in Christ from the foundation of the world. Acts 2.39, we read a moment ago, The promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And that is, of course, immediately the verse following after the command to be baptized. Why not the baptismal form you of Matthew 28.18-20? through 20? It's rather interesting, we never find it once in the book of Acts. Some folks insist that that particular formula is necessary to have a valid baptism. But it's never in the book of Acts. Here is what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and we'll talk about the reason why we don't see it at any of the adult baptisms in the book of Acts. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And since we've been discussing the name of God at our morning worship services, it's rather interesting that that name is in the singular. 
The Trinity is mentioned. They are clearly distinct persons one from another, co-equal in all of their divine attributes, and yet with distinct personages, and each of them with distinct responsibilities which they have chosen in the eternal counsels of God. But it says name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, what was the last thing that he had commanded them, which is verse 19, the immediate preceding verse, was there to teach all nations and there to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And yet we don't find that formula even once in the book of Acts, or anywhere else in the New Testament, for that matter. Were the apostles being disobedient when they didn't use the formula? Was that the issue? Was what God was concerned about the formula itself and what were the words that would be said at the point of baptism? Or was it something else? Well, I think the answer is because we see a conflict in the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, with those who were practicing magic formulas. And we find no magic formulas in the New Testament, as in the occult practices. The Jews in Acts 2 needed to repent, that is, radically change their minds and their attitudes concerning Jesus in the context of Peter's sermon. They already knew the God of the Old Testament, and the Pentecost was a clear fulfillment of Joel chapter 2 concerning the new work of the Holy Spirit. What they had to get straight at that point was the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. In the book of Acts, the issue is the Lord Jesus, not the Trinity, though the Trinity is truly a key and cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith. But all the way through the book of Acts, the issue is who is Jesus and what did he do for you? And so we find all the baptisms mentioning a formula of any kind refer in the book of Acts only to the Lord Jesus. Samaria. Here we find baptism applied to both men and women. Rather interesting. Here's some food for thought. If baptism is the New Testament symbol that replaces Old Testament circumcision, and if it's a quid pro quo, if it's a complete exchange, where now circumcision is out and baptism is in, and circumcision was part of the Old Covenant, and baptism is what takes its place in the New Covenant, pay attention, folks, let's stick with Scripture, not with tradition. If baptism is the New Testament symbol that replaces Old Testament circumcision, then women would not be baptized in the New Testament because in the Old Testament, only males were circumcised. Something else for thought. There are some groups, especially in Africa, that practice female circumcision as well as male circumcision. In Acts 8.12 we read, When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. In verse 16, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. We see the eunuch, who is our text for tonight in Acts 8.34. They stop the chariot because the eunuch realizes he wants to be baptized. He wants to identify with Christ. Philip tells him the only way you can do that is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's just been hearing the passage in Isaiah that deals with the suffering servant, the death of Christ, and the resurrection. We move to Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 18, and here we find the baptism of Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. Another adult baptism, a believer's baptism in the New Testament. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel, speaking to Ananias, unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, 
and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been, scales, and he received his sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. We're going to talk about that last phrase in just a moment. Here's a man who for three days has been fasting. He's had his Damascus Road experience. He's seen the Shekinah glory of God. He's heard the one speaking to him out of the Shekinah glory and say, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And he says, what wilt thou have me to do, Lord? Three days later is when he's baptized when he's had time to meditate on, contemplate, think about what he has just seen. And Paul, who was at that time Saul, was skilled in the Old Testament. What do you think he was thinking about for three days? As many dozens of scriptures were brought to his mind by the Holy Spirit, he began to understand, blind in his physical sight, but suddenly his eyes spiritually have been opened and he sees in all the scriptures Christ, which we have just studied for three weeks in each of the Old Testament books. He begins to realize, yes, that is the Shekinah. That is what appeared to Moses. The Lord Jesus Christ must have been the one who called himself I Am, who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. He must have been the one who spoke to Abraham, who as the Lord came with the two angels and the two angels went on down to Sodom, the Lord says to Abraham, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I am about to do? And Jesus claimed to have spoken to Abraham. He begins to realize those passages in the scriptures like Psalm 22 which describe the crucifixion. Suddenly it comes to Paul's mind. He understands what took place and how a thousand years before the birth of Christ, David had prophesied concerning what would happen on the cross. Three days God gave him to meditate on the scripture that he had memorized. God opens our eyes when we memorize scripture and when we meditate upon it. Do you have a regular program of scripture memory and meditation? It may come in handy someday when you are lying flat on your back in bed in a hospital or somewhere else when all you have is the scripture that you have memorized. Perhaps blind like Saul, Paul. Perhaps deaf, perhaps in a coma. And God brings back to your mind the great and precious promises that he has made. There's Saul. How about Cornelius in his household? Again, we find some adults here. They received the Holy Spirit before their water baptism. Acts 10, 37, that word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Now here he gets to the heart of the gospel. Whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. And to him give all the prophets witness, again, Christ, in all the scriptures, that through his name, morning worship services, studying the name of God, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Back to Acts 2.38. Peter is saying here the same thing that he said in Acts 2.38 concerning the remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed, that's the Jews who accompanied Peter, 
were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost, as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized, interesting formula, in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. We find another adult baptism over in Acts 16 with Lydia, a female head of the household, and all those who were under her authority were baptized. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come into my house and abide there, and she constrained us. We've already looked at the Philippian jailer and talked about him. That's Acts 16, 25 through 34. Next we find in Acts chapter 18, verse 8, Crispus and others who are baptized after their faith, it's not necessary for their salvation. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. We find the Old Testament believers who were followers of John the Baptist. These are adults. They are Jews. They also, upon their faith in the promised Messiah, spoke in these foreign languages, although not all in the book of Acts did so. In Acts 19, beginning in verse 1, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. <laughs> they had been walking what appeared to be Christian lives. They were followers of John the Baptist. In fact, it says so here. But they had not heard that Christ had come and gone. He said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, here you have a rebaptism. Folks, there are certain people that need to be rebaptized. Here we find people that had believed John's message, were baptized with the baptism of John, which was a baptism unto repentance for national Israel, but they had to be rebaptized. Listen to it. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. It was a minyan. It was the minimum necessary number of Jewish men to form a synagogue. We'll get to that and talk more about it, and how come the Holy Spirit came on them after they were baptized, rather than at the point at which they believed when we get to Acts chapter 19. But you'll notice here, here's another group of adults who are baptized, and these are people who are already Old Testament believers who are being re-baptized. Anybody who comes out of a non-Christian and Old Testament believers are not Christians. They're saved, they're on the way to heaven, they're going to be up there in glory, but they're not part of the church. We find a very clear illustration of that here with these Jewish men in Acts chapter 19. Israel and the church are different. They are distinct groups within the purpose and plan of God. And here we find those who were part of this Old Testament group who had heard John preach, who had believed John, who had been baptized by John, and had moved back to Ephesus, and when Paul gets there and preaches to them, he suddenly discovers there's some confusion. There's a lack of knowledge. There's a lack of understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. And so when they believe, he baptizes them again. I would encourage anyone who's been baptized Catholic or baptized Mormon 
or baptized whatever else is out there, Church of Christ or whatever, they need to be rebaptized because they were not baptized in relation to the Christ of Scripture. Very important issue. Other passages that sometimes are questioned, Paul referring back to his conversion in Acts 9, he refers to that in his sermon in Acts 22. And he says there, And now why tarriest thou, quoting what was said back in Acts 9, Why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There are two units of thought in this verse. Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Rather interesting, and we won't bother with getting into an argument or discussion over this, but arise, the word is a command, it means stand up, or standing, actually it's a verbal form, it's a verbal command, standing, be baptized. What are the modes that you can use for that? And wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what's connected to the washing away of sins, not to the application of the water. And that's what Peter said in Acts 2.21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So summary. All the adult baptisms and acts that mention a formula refer only to Jesus. None of them took place in a church building, which is obviously not necessary for a valid baptism, as against the teaching of the so-called Church of Christ and the Mormons, which say you have to be baptized in one of their places. The only possible exception to that is Crispus at Corinth, since the location is not mentioned, but we know where all the other locations were. You know, somewhere close outside the temple, um, in a house like Cornelius, uh, in a prison like the Philippian jailer, uh, by a riverside. These are not church buildings where they were baptized. Jerusalem, Jewish males in the temple baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Samaria, Samaritans, male and female, and Simon the sorcerer baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ethiopian eunuch, neither male nor female. No baptismal formula is mentioned in Acts 8. Saul, Paul, three days after conversion, no baptismal formula mentioned. Cornelius and household, Gentile, male, female, household, received the Holy Spirit before water baptism, baptized in the name of the Lord. Lydia, female head of house, household baptism, no baptismal formula mentioned. Philippian jailer, faith alone for salvation, baptism afterward, salvation and baptism of entire family, no baptismal formula mentioned in Acts 16. Crispus, household and other Corinthians, baptism after faith, not necessary for salvation, no baptismal formula mentioned. Acts 18, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. And then those whom we just mentioned a moment ago, the Old Testament believers who had followed John the Baptist, Jewish Old Testament saints, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 19. And of course, the Apostle Paul in Acts 22, quoting back to Acts 9, and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that is what we must remember as we look at the issue of baptism. It is not for salvation. That was clear in Acts chapter 2. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the joy and delight of knowing that it is not our works that save us. It's not our baptism. It's not partaking of the Lord's table. It's not church membership. It's nothing that we have done that either saves us or even adds to our salvation. It is the grace of God through faith in the Christ of scriptures and in him alone. And salvation is your gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. Help us, Father, to be able to answer those who challenge and twist the doctrine of baptism, whether of adult baptism or of infant baptism, to try to make it a part of salvation. For there are heresies on every side of this issue. But we must always ask, what saith the scripture? 
for that is our final authority in all matters of both faith and practice. And so, Father, we commit this, your word, to you tonight and pray that you will use it in our hearts to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.